we don't buy the what, we buy the who and the why. Mm -hmm. And with women's sports specifically, we never know the who and the why. Like, you're not selling women's basketball, bro. Like, women's basketball's not that great. Like, no. I don't come to the game because I love watching women's basketball. I come to the game because I know so-and-so. Because Diana Taurasi finna act a fool. She finna score from whatever, right? Like, I come to the game because, I, oh, my God. Like, Imani with Texas, I remember her playing in Texas when I was there. Or, oh, my God, my Morris from Georgia. Like, I'm from Georgia, too. Those are the, you know, like, you buy the stories. Like, for sure. People don't watch 90... It's 90 something games for the NBA before playoffs, bro. You tell me people like basketball that much that they're watching 90 games, dog. Got the ball podcast. <laughs> well, all the way. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on, ballers? And welcome to another episode of Beyond the Ball. Uh, I'm your host, Jonathan Jones, and this is the Beyond the Ball podcast. And we're in the Speak Your Success media studios and i'm excited today just to be able to sit down and be able to have a real conversation um just talking about well we're gonna, we're gonna see where the conversation goes we're gonna see where the conversation goes but uh we we, we have we have a guest here who's highly decorated highly accomplished um you know you've you uh co division one college hooper right um pro hooper WNBA, abroad overseas poet author Attorney, I mean, we could just go all down the line with 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 the hyphens. Uh, but we have Miss Amani McGee Stafford. How are you doing, ma'am? I'm doing great. It sounds really good when you put it like that. You know? I, I was gonna I was gonna ask it you like what sounds I'm, really good when yeah. you put it all together. Uh, yeah, I mean, how, how do you, like when you when you sit there and when you hear that about yourself, like what what thoughts come to your mind? Um, well, first and foremost, I am a lawyer, not an attorney yet. Oh, okay, okay, um, okay. Almost, I gotta take the bar. But I'm just getting used to the lawyer moniker. So mm -hmm. when I hear that, it feels really good. Okay. Um, Cause it's very fresh. I'm like yeah. less than a year from graduation. So I think for me, like I always say I'm a dreamer. Um, I feel like I have to live a hundred lives. So I'm gonna try to do that in all of the time I have here. Um, and that's, that's like, I think that's what my life looks like. Like I wake up and I decide I wanna do something and then I go do it. Man. Yeah. Well, well why, why do you feel like you have to live a hundred lives? Um, I just, I've always just been into so many things and I feel like it's my blessing and my curse to try and accomplish them all and mm -hmm. um, live a fulfilling life. I think we kind of have been told for so long, you only can be good at one thing. When in reality, like some people can only be good at one thing. Mm. I think a lot of us, if we had the confidence to chase our dreams, we would be good at more than one thing. And that's kind of my goal. Like, I just want to enjoy my life to the fullest. And to me, that means when I get an idea or a passion, I want to, like, chase that out. For sure. For sure. When, when if you if you go back, when do you recall you first being into, like, doing multiple things? Like, when when like when, when did when did that start for you? Because, you know, typically I know. Uh, just looking back in the in, in the athlete realm, you know, uh, a lot of us get started like with soccer and then like soccer is what gives us the foundational skills like footwork and coordination and all that. And then it transitions like maybe basketball and then we start to branch out to different things. But do you can you recall when when you first were like, oh, I think it's a handful of things or I'm, I'm over here and I'm over here type deal? Um, I would say since I was a kid. Um, um, like, you know, my family, my older brother's in three-time NBA champion. My mother's in the Hall of Fame. My father played collegially. So everyone knew I was going to play basketball <laughs> outside of me. So my dad was very nervous that, like, he would force me to play basketball. Mm -hmm. And I would get burned out by the time it became serious. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, like, he made me beg him to play basketball. So growing wow. up, I did theater. Um, I always was writing. I was always into reading and poetry. Like I love to read. So I pretty much did everything but basketball until high school. Wow. And uh, wow. Until high school. Yeah. I didn't start playing seriously until high school. My first real game was in seventh grade. I played on a boys team in middle school and I broke my ankle in the first game and it didn't heal until freshman year of high school. Dang. Yeah. Okay. Well, what, what made, what made you stick with it? Was it the... Yeah, what, what what made you stick with it? I mean, I, I, I understand, you know, your brother, three-time NBA champions, like you said, your mom, Hall of Fame. 
like with that basketball legacy, is that what made you stick with it or you just were, you, you enjoyed it or what was it? Um, I've always been a very logical person. I was 6'5 and 13. Freshman year, I made the lead in the school play and I made varsity basketball. And I had to ask myself, like, which one's going to get us further? <laughs> I knew I wasn't, um, I knew we were, we, I wasn't able to pay for college. So my goal was always get a free education. Mm. Um, so like at 6'5", there's not many roles at Juilliard for women. And I kind of had to make a realistic decision. My high school coach did tell me, he was like, it's okay, just pick basketball now. And then <laughs> you can come back your senior year and do the play and do all that. It never happened. However, I would say that basketball panned out pretty well for me. Yeah, I think it did all right. I think it did all right. Yeah, yeah. So wait, so when it when it comes to when it comes to acting, I have two questions here. When it comes to acting, typically actresses are like tiny. What? They're all like five two. So that because I I mean because every time I think of like actors or actresses, I always think of like Tay Diggs, and he's like tiny. Yeah. Okay, for instance, my my crush growing up was Morris Chestnut. Okay, like. Uh, obsessed. I met him in high school. He's five nine. No, he's not. Yes, but th- th- the camera is like. Does he not look like he's six five on best man? He, he at least could be like six three. Yeah. He is a five nine man. Maybe five ten on a good day. Mm. Yeah, like no. Even though like now I, I do like commercials and stuff, but most of it is just me being playing basketball. <laughs> mm, I got you. I got because I was gonna I was gonna ask like, is there still an interest in acting, or do you still desire to? You know, do because even if you, even with you doing the commercials, like, is there something further than that that you would, you would like to see yourself in or be a part of? If there was a leading role for a six five woman somewhere where I'm not playing a basketball player, I would love to do it. Um, but I, I that's how that was my background. Like I started, I was always doing like the Easter Sunday plays. Uh-huh. I was always doing like the longest speech possible, like. <laughs> That was always my thing. So it was just something I enjoyed doing. Um, But I really thought like I was going to be Alicia Keys. I used to write music, sing, and I was going to be an actress. Like I had my whole little artsy life planned out and then I just kept growing and (laughs) it changed it for me a little bit. Okay, so what about singing now? Talk about it. Like are you still, do you still hold a note every once in a while? Like what what does that look like? Because I mean, if if you were writing music and you were singing, that means that there was a passion there or the passion still might be there. Um, So writing music turned into writing poetry. Okay. Um, Up until seventh grade and seventh grade, we read Night, Diary Anne Frank and Tupac's poetry in English. And that like changed my life. Um, One, because the idea of like a 12 year old girl having a voice and people caring, Mm. like people, almost 100 years later, still wondering about what this girl said and, like, the power of that for me, specifically coming from where, where like, my neighborhood and my family dynamic, that was unheard of. Um, I only knew Tupac as a rapper, so listening to his poetry, like, I didn't even know what poetry was, and that was, like, my first introduction to it. Mm. And so, like, music kind of died at that moment, and I started writing poetry, and it was kind of from there. Um, I still sing. If you know me well enough, you've heard me sing, like, just because I sing around the house and stuff. But, like, in a serious thing, like, no, it's not happening. No, 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 no. I wish I would have kept going because I pretty much stopped singing, like, seventh, eighth grade. And I wish I would have kept going because I'd probably be able to, like, blow for real, right now. Yeah, for real, for real. But now I feel like I can sing good enough. I can sing good enough to impress somebody when I need to. <laughs> so would you say that's the hidden talent that, that you have? Like, if, if somebody was to meet you now, you know, of course, the assumption is going to be like, oh, okay, she hoops. And then, you know, they, they, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to say they would, they would assume that, that, that you write as well, but would you say the, the singing? Yeah. Is like the, that's that's the probably talent? my hidden talent. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cool. I, I've always, I've always wished that I could sing because you know, when people sing, it's just like, wow. Like you get people's attention. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah. wait, what? And it's just, and everything just sounds good. It sounds better when they sing. It's anytime a man starts singing for me, I'm, I'm gone. It doesn't matter. I'm sold. Like, listen, that is it. It's like, it's just not fair. It's It's just not not fair. It's just, it's one of those things where you just, I feel that way about people that play instruments too. Blown away. Yeah. Anytime I like find out somebody plays instruments, I'm just so enamored. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Like those things are just something. And maybe it's because I can't do it, but I don't know. Like I just think those things always get me immediately. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, for me, it's it's like a level of mastery. Yes. Like when I see anybody do, because when I see comedians get up there and I'm like, wow, like you've really mastered the storytelling. You really mastered talking about this and then coming back and then bringing it full circle. Dave Chappelle in his <laughs> stand-ups, when he does it, like he brings things 
full circle. So, you know, just, just in terms of level of mastery. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, where, where, do you, where do you feel your level of mastery lies? Like out of all the things that you're able to do, or is it, is it, is it more than one area, right? Because, you know, just like I told you before, with, with this show, with uh, Beyond the Ball, the goal is to focus on helping student athletes succeed beyond their degree. And I feel like that always starts with, you know, like a self-assessment and identifying where, where you're gifted or where you desire to be a master of area I, or areas. I think um, my level of mastery, I think first and foremost, just looking at the stats would be basketball. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily know if I would agree with that as a personal assessment, but I feel like looking at like my history, basketball would have to be the answer. Um, and I learned a very long time ago, like people care what I have to say. People care anything about me because I'm good at basketball. Mm. Like that's where it starts. If you're not good at basketball, nobody cares. And that's, mm. that's like, I think that's kind of for everybody. Like you have to be good at what you do first and then you can move into other things. But if you're not good at what gets the bread on the table, it don't matter. Mm. You know what I mean? I think, that's real. I think that's how we have to start. And I figured that out very quickly. Like. Nobody like people don't want you doing multiple things. So if you're not amazing or very much highly proficient at what you started with, you can't move into other arenas because people feel as though you're not focused. Mm-hmm. This is true. Yeah. It's 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 sad. It's sad, but it's it's so so true. But I want to go back to what you said. You said you don't necessarily agree with that as a personal assessment. Nah. From a personal assessment, where where do you, where do you feel your match? Because I have seen I have seen the stats, I've seen the double doubles, I've seen the blocks, I've seen the rebounds, and I've seen it at you know the levels. You've done it at the highest level. I just feel like I have so much more room to grow in basketball, mm. which I think is a crazy thing to say at twenty nine. But um, it's a catch twenty two because me and Brianna Stewart are the same age, same same class, right? Mm. Like I always tell the story. I got I started getting recruited because I blocked Brianna Stewart at USA basketball camp and everyone was like who just blocked Brianna Stewart because Bri has been been that way since we were 13 like she's always been the pinnacle since we were kids mm. she was never not her mm. um so I blocked her and people started recruiting me shout out to Bri Stewart appreciate you um and so for me like I thank my dad for not forcing me to play basketball because I think it cultivated a certain like want and love for it for me like that it was authentic but in the same regard like my first car was a Hyundai Breeze was a Mazi. Like, maybe you should have forced me to play basketball early. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> like, I feel like maybe you should have forced me to play from a young age. I don't know. It might have been a little different. Yeah. So, I, for me, because I started playing so late, um, and I also start, took it serious very much really late. Um, I didn't really take it serious till like junior college. I think I have so much more room to grow in basketball, um, mm. which is a good feeling for me. Maybe not for my agents and other people, but for me, it's a great feeling. <laughs> Um, and so I would think like, and this is probably not, it's probably like going to be a weird answer, but I would think the level of mastery I would say would be in knowing myself, Mm. um, not necessarily a trait or a skill because I feel like, I I feel like I'm just kind of an insatiable person. Like, I feel like there's always room to be better. There's always room to figure out, um, what's the next level, et cetera. Um, but one thing I feel like I've mastered is knowing myself and knowing who I am, regardless of the outcome of the situation or what situations I'm in. And I don't know if everybody's able to say that. And that's something I feel like very proud about. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, how do you how do you balance that, though? Like wanting to grow, wanting to get better. How do you balance that in terms of. Where do I know when to I, I don't want to say where do I know when to stop, mm. but like in terms of like not being so critical on yourself, for instance, the, the best example is. Okay, you know, you, you, had a, you had a game where you might have had 32, 14, and like 10 blocks. But you're That'd like, be amazing. Ah. Speak that into my life. <laughs> I, I mean, I've seen the stats. It's not too far off. That's not too far off. But, but it's like, oh, man, but I missed two free throws, right? And then you go back, and, and then you're dissecting that. But the team won. You had a solid game, had a triple-double, double-double. But, like, how do you know when to say it's like, okay, let me go to sleep. And then we're going to just get back at it tomorrow, fresh day. And, and not just basketball, but, you know, any of the areas of, of, of your life. Um, I think that is what greatness is. I think you don't know. I think you're not supposed to know. Um, and it's 50-50. I think it's very much catch-22. Like, one of my goals for this year was to, like, step into a life of ease um, and faith. 
because I feel like everything I put myself, everything I put my mind to and I prepare for genuinely, I always accomplish. Like mm. I, I get everything I want. And that sounds so arrogant. And it may not come on my timeline, but it always comes. Mm. Right. And so my goal this year was to understand that about myself and my God and enjoy the process. But mm. it's like, like truly just enjoy like knowing instead of stressing about it, because like you could ask my cousin, like my family, like I be stressed. I'd be like, oh, it's not going to happen. And I'm like, I'm working so hard. And it's like, it's actually kind of manic, like manic the way I work. But it's because I don't know. I like, I feel like I got to do all this work for it to come. And so my goal this year was to be more like, okay, we're going to do the work, but I know it's coming. I just don't know when. Like, so let me just do the work. It doesn't have to be like, but I, I haven't been, my goal has been, been to be less serious. I haven't been doing great so far. We're three months into the year. But <laughs> that's been like one of my goals. And I, I think it's a catch-22 for real because I feel like people that do are like, I've done enough. Mm-hmm. I feel like they never really reach their potential. Ooh. Um, and then the flip side of that, and I'm, I'm arguably one of those people that, that people could say I didn't reach my potential, top 10 pick. Top, you know, like, so it definitely depends on who's who has the measuring stick. But... I feel like you have to kind of want that drive. Like, I, I'm a I'm a film nerd. After every game, you're going to catch me watching the game after the game, going through it. I got to do it immediately. Like, I don't go to bed. I do really? it. And then I go to sleep. But I do it after every game. Like, it's just kind of who I am. Like, so, I don't know the answer to that. And, no, I, and I feel like when I'm ready to say, like, I've done enough, I feel like that's when I'm sitting down. Like, that's when I'm kicking up. I ain't doing nothing else. Mm. I get that. No, no, I, I get that because I mean, in my in my mind, because like when I go to school, college and stuff, and I speak, after I'll go back and watch it, and I'm know I'm like, ah, let me just, uh, I should watch it later. I'll read the surveys, I'll listen yeah. to what they had to say, I'll find the critiques. It's like I know I should just, you know, just take it easy. But I mean, to to your point, and I've watched the interviews on, you know, the extremely successful people, and they're just like you say, like I'm not sure if you've seen the Tom Brady documentary. My man sits there on Sundays with just watching film, watching film, drinking a protein shake, hours, just locked in. And it's like, oh my God. But you know, if, if to, to, to leave a legacy and to do something that nobody's ever done and to be the best version of yourself, I, I, feel, that, I feel that is what it takes. Yeah, like, I, I, don't, like, I don't know another <laughs> way. Like, I think, I think that's how it has to be for real. Yeah. Like, I think you just have to have that kind of like, okay, today was good, but tomorrow could be better. Mm. And then did you, was, was this something that you, you just built in yourself? Or this is something like you seen your, your brother, your mom, your dad, like where, where, where did this drive come from? Or you feel like it was just something that was just, you know, nurtured and cultivated as you found that interest? Um, I think early on, and it's funny because my brother's like this too. I think early on it was about, it was out of spite. <laughs> like I, I laugh all the time because I'm better at it now. But when I, I used to be like, bro, I need negative reinforcement. Like positive doesn't work. <laughs> like I need negative reinforcement. Like a lot of it was because like I didn't want to be. I wanted to be better than people. Like it was just that anger about it. Like I wanted to be better than people. Like where I came from, I wanted to be like yo. Like yeah, I did all that, and this is where I came from. Look at me now, type time. Like a lot of it was mm. that. Um, I think now that I've gotten older, I've figured out how to kind of create my own like standards of success. So it isn't necessarily externally motivated. Um, I don't think I have a great drive. I think I understand that about myself and I put myself in situations to succeed. Um, I was talking about my my trainer yesterday, actually. I was like, I have no will. I'm just not, I don't have, I'm not the person that's like, Ooh, I want to run until I'm about to throw up. I'm going to just keep going. I don't have that in me, bro. Like, I don't be tired. I be lazy. Mm. I don't want to do another rep. Not because I can't. I'm just like, bro, what am I here for? Like, oh, God. <laughs> Especially when I don't have a job. Mm. Like, right now, like, I'm waiting for a call. Like, to, so to keep myself locked in. Because once I get a job, I can, I see it, see why I'm doing it. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So I could be like, all right, cool. We got to be ready by X, Y, Z. Da, 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 da. This, like, this is the money. You feel me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's easy. For sure, for sure. But when I don't, when I'm just at the crib waiting to get somebody, for somebody to tell me, like, come on, we want you, da-da-da, like, I've created a system so that I can't rely on myself, right? So, like, I'm not the type of person that can go to the gym and play, shoot by myself and get a workout in. I got to have a trainer. Because if it's up to me, I'm not going to go. Mm. But I'm not, I'm not going to disrespect someone else's time. Mm. Furthermore, I pay for it, yeah, so, right? Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to yeah, show yeah. up, right? So I create a world where the discipline is 
integrated into it as opposed to it being my own kind of like will and consciously choice. Like I don't have that. <laughs> like I appreciate I people do that. Like, like I'm sure LeBron, Kobe, they got that in them. Like mm-hmm. it's here. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that person. <laughs> I'm not that person. So I, I have to create the environment where I don't have a choice but to be that person. I get it. I get it. I get it. So in, in terms of like uh like the 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 other like pockets of your life, because you know, you 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 have the you have the title of, you know, professional basketball player. Uh, but but then even even outside of that, like you've j- just like I said before, just in terms of like your, you know, your accomplishment and things that you've done and like what you stand for. And, and I, I've seen the, the, the work that you do around around like mental health and having those conversations. What why is it that you decided to start having those conversations? And I know earlier you said, you know, when you're when you're a basketball player, and you can and you can ball, right? Let's just be clear. Let's be clear. You're a basketball player, and you can ball, right? You can hoop. Then people do listen to you. W- when did you decide to say, okay, I think more people need to start hearing this about about mental health? Like, let's have this conversation. Um, it wasn't even on purpose. Um, everyone like that's like, that's why I think it's so funny when people like that don't know me from jump know my story because they think like I'm this great person. And I'm so courageous. And I'm like, bro, this was an accident. God is good. <laughs> like, like, and it, it, it's also something I'm very proud of because people that have seen me grow up and seen the person I've come, become, like, nobody thought I was going to turn into this. Mm. What? Dang. Please. Ain't nobody see this in my future. So, oh, yeah. you know, I think for me, like, when I was 19, um, well, high school was very hard for me. I got kicked out of my house, committed. Like, high school was a mess for me. Mm. College was very much my saving grace because it was stability. Um, mm. I had access to mental health resources I never had. Um, I had health insurance. Like, <laughs> like college was like really saving grace for me. Um, and so during that time, I had figured out that I was sexually abused growing up. I was like coming to terms with that. Um, I was getting vocabulary words such as depression, mm. right? Mental illness. I didn't like. I had no concept of those things. I just mm. knew how I felt. I just knew that it was. I, I always felt like there was something wrong with me. I never really had. I just always felt different. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, so going, leaving high school, going into early college, I was getting like confirmation of how I've been feeling. Right. I was getting words to describe these things. Um, and my poetry was becoming a little deeper as well. At the time I was writing a poem confronting my abuser and Austin has a really big, um, poetry scene. Mm. Um, so I was getting into slam poetry and performing my pieces and um, my coach, I had to miss something in the summer to go do slam poetry called Brave New Voices. And my coach was like, you could do it, but you got to take Longhorn Network. Um, Long- I don't even think Longhorn Network exists anymore. Uh, I, 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 think, I think it still does. It does? They, 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 they created like a whole, they got a, like a podcast network thing going on. Yeah. So at the time, right, I was like, cool, nobody gets Longhorn Network. Like, <laughs> right, it's going to come on on Thursday, like whatever. And the piece I was performing, they thought we were going to be talking about like rainbows and sunshine. Uh-huh. And the piece I was performing was really hard and heavy. And they were like, whoa, like, are you comfortable talking about this? And it's literally a clip of me and 19 year olds being like, and eh, I probably wouldn't regret it when I get older, but sure, let's do it. <laughs> and I'm thinking like, right, like no one's going to see this. Like, who cares? Yeah, yeah, for sure. ESPN owns Longhorn Network. ESPN sees the piece. They're like, it's got to be bigger. Turns it into Sports Center feature. It becomes so much bigger than me. The dude that wrote the piece actually won like an award about it. Like it becomes this huge thing. They start running it during March Madness. Every time I, before I play, they run a the piece. Mm. Anytime Texas is on screen, they run a the piece. Wow. It's huge, and I remember being so scared, like ashamed, embarrassed, and the craziest thing happened. Like so many people I know my entire life, people I never met, reached out to me like, "Yo, this was my story." Like I've never been able to tell nobody, but this is what I went through. Or like, thank you so much for like confirming mm-hmm. me, right? Affirming the things I feel or who I've been. Um, and at that moment, I was like, it's like a light switch came on. Like, oh, this is why I'm 6'7". This is why every time I tried to kill myself, it didn't work. This is why I was given this, these burdens and this story. This is it. Like, this is the purpose. This is why I play ball. So that I can use my platform to not only speak of God's grace and God's power, but to show people that there's more. Like, that this isn't going to be your last moment. This isn't going to be like your entire story that there's something after this trauma and furthermore every time i looked for mental health or mental illness growing up it was somebody super happy somebody jumping off a bridge and they were probably white 
Mm-hmm. It was never nobody looked like me. Mm-hmm. Never I came from where I came from. Um, and it was nobody that had my story. So I was like, oh, all these mics in my face are here for a reason. Like, this is what we're doing. Um, and it just kind of took off from there. Like, and every time, and like, I'm a preacher's kid, so, you know, God is good. I'm always going to mention God. Uh, but every time I felt like it was uncomfortable or like I was embarrassed by it, like I would meet somebody that was like, thank you so much, or this is my story, and I'm so appreciative of you doing this, or, um, like, I read your poem, and it gave me a reason, and, like, I can't, I can't put into words those experiences, like, it just is, it, like, it's so crazy living in a dark place and finding your purpose, and finding that reason where you're, like, this is what it's for, Mm. so, to me, everything always boils down to those moments, like, that's it. Like, I, I get why I do everything I do. Like, my purpose in life is to create safe spaces. What does that look like for me tangibly and everywhere I go? A lot of that means that I got to tell my story. And even when it's uncomfortable, like, I'm doing the younger version of me a disservice mm. to hide that. Especially because I'm not in active danger. I have the platform given to me from basketball. I have the voice. I'm able to articulate in a way that people understand and connect with. Like, why not? So, like, that's, that's just how I move through the world. And whatever opportunities come my way or career paths come my way, it always boils down to that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really dope that you're you're comfortable being yourself. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was just looking at some of your posts and some of the other stuff. And I, I want to I get the quote correct, okay? I want to I wanna say the Shut quote up. exactly exactly how you said it. It'd be so funny because people be right. trying to quote me. I'll be like, I said that? That's crazy. <laughs> oh, man. I can't even find a quote. But basically, you, you were saying... Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes, like, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but like, you know, so, sometimes you feel like you're a role model and mm-hmm. you feel like you're doing things right and everything like that. But then other times, like, you just feel like you're a complete mess. And I think that's so relatable because I think it's, it, it is a disservice to where when we see people, at, and this isn't directed at you, but when we see people at the highest level, then the next time we may see them, it's like when something comes out. Right. Versus somebody just saying, hey, you know, this is like I'm me, you know, take, take the parts of me, take all the parts of me. If you want me at all, then you just got to take me. So, I mean, I, I just commend you on just just being that being that transparent person, you know, sharing, sharing what you've been through, sharing your struggle and um, just sharing like pain and life in real time. Yeah, I get that. I think um, I used to say I don't want to be a role model. I'm not a role model. That's what I used to say when I was uh-huh. younger. Uh <laughs> And I remember getting into an argument with one, like a huge Texas fan because she was like, every time you used to say, I used to get so mad because you play women's basketball, you're wearing a jersey, you are a role model. And I realized the reason I didn't like the term role model is because of the way I thought of the word. Mm. To me, role model was somebody that was perfect and they were this great. And I was like, that ain't me. Like, <laughs> that is not me, bro. Like, I got a potty mouth. I'm going to talk about <laughs> Like, I'm going to act a fool. Yeah. <laughs> I can't promise you that this is going to be great every day. Like, sure. I'm nobody's role model. And then I realized, like, to me, like, that's what a role model is, though. Like, can I still make the right decisions even when those decisions aren't easy? Can I still be true to the things that I feel are part of my character and my ideals even when that's not the best choice? Can I show up when I done did some dumb shit <laughs> and everybody knows? And can I still show up as myself and not like cower in the background because I messed up publicly? And baby, I've done it <laughs> a lot of times. <laughs> so to me, like that's a role model. And I feel like when I say create safe spaces, my goal is that we create this, this kind of common vulnerability so people can show up as their authentic selves because we're all doing somebody a disservice when we show up perfect or what we think is perfect. Because you don't know how many people out there are waiting for your story, your reality. Like I tell people all the time, like even like right now I'm in a speakers, the speakers um, kind of group and we're learning how to like better market yourself. And, mm-hmm. and my thing is I teach people how to be their authentic selves and tap in with their divine purpose, regardless of the obstacles and shame they carry with them. Right. And what does that look like? It's saying like, I don't have to be great all the time and I can't show up how I think I'm supposed to show up because only I can bring to this space what I have to bring to this space, right? Like whether you believe in God, the universe, whatever it is, but you are divinely created to give the world this thing and no one else can do it. It's just you. 
But if we're showing up like how we think we're supposed to or somebody else or not all of us, the world doesn't get what we have to give. So how do you create an environment where you feel comfortable to do that? And to me, it's showing up first. That's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's real. I didn't know you were a preacher's kid. I am a preacher's kid, child. I'm a preacher's like, kid too. That's fourth funny. generation boy. We really? Southern Baptist down. Man, so y'all, so y'all go into the church. Y'all do y'all thing, and y'all go hoop, huh? Yeah, uh-huh. literally. So I used to, I used to have to go to early service if I had anything on the weekend. I had to go to early service, seven forty-five. Oh my goodness! And then I could go play the tournament. That was me. Like wow. Yeah. Oh, I used man. to be the one to invite all the, all, you want to go hang out? And they knew they had to go to church if they hung out with me. <laughs> that was me growing up, for sure. Dang. Okay. Okay. Talk, talk about, just, just for, um, for, uh, for, for a second, I want you to talk about just you stepping into um, being an attorney. Is it you said you said you're an attorney right now? Lawyer. You're a lawyer. Attorney. You're so attorney is bar, a lawyer okay. finished school. There we go. There we go. Help me. So stepping into the, the, the realm of, of the law. Mm-hmm. Why? Why 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 are you stepping into the realm of why why are we tapping our toes in there? Man, uh so again, creating sex space is very and like I thought like I've been speaking since I was like twenty. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm a hope dealer. Like I tell people like, yo, I've been here, it gets better, mm-hmm. like this is how we get to the better. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Right. And I'm like, I want to do something more tangible. Like I want to really like create change. So I started looking in different ways. I'm not going to be a politician. <laughs> like it's not, I would have been like shorty from Rhode Island. Uh. That was Torque. That was me. That's why I'm not even going to embarrass y'all like that. Like I'm going to just stay out the way. You know what I mean? Like, That's hilarious. That would have been me. So I'm not a politician. Cool. Um, so I was trying to figure out like, what does that look like? I don't mess with the feds. So I'm not going to be a cop. Like, okay. Lord law. Okay. So I started looking into it. I'm like, I think law might be the might be the thing for me, right? And then I started thinking about like the numbers of it. When you think about mental health, 95% of practitioners are not black. So 95% is probably gonna be majority white. So when I finally get courage to like tackle mental illness, mental health, mental wellness, I'm probably gonna meet somebody that doesn't look like me, may not understand my experience or even care about it. Hmm go to law, right? Law has the same numbers, 5% black men and women. In mental health, that, that other 5% is every other. But in law, you got 5% black men and women lawyers. So again, I got over 90% chance that once I come to this space, I'm gonna meet somebody that doesn't understand my experience, may not even care, doesn't look like me. And how, how hard is it because of what we have as black people going through in this country to even get to the point to ask for help in those two realms? Right. So when I finally get there, I'm probably going to be discouraged again because I'm going to meet somebody that doesn't look like me. So I was like, okay, cool. Like, I got to do it. Like, I got to do it. Like, Mm. especially for me, like, I grew up in Inglewood, California. I kicked out of high school. Like, I'm a little baby kid for real. Like, like I'm I'm really a little hood rat for real. Like, so for me to be able to do it, Uh then for sure you could do it. And so a lot of it was proving I could. And then two, like, being a space of, of representation. Like I got tattoos on my hands, my ear, like I'm like, and I could be in this room and, and feel confident and, and prepared. Like that means something. Like I'm a huge person when it comes to representation. Mm. I, I, think, I think we always go back in the hood and we like, you wanna grow up and be a doctor. You wanna get your degree, go do this, go this. Bro, nobody in my house has, like, I don't know it. I don't like, even for me, when I was going through law school, I got kicked out. I was academically disqualified. Now I had a list of excuses for why, but more of the story was, it was hard, okay? I get you, <laughs> like, I get you. And when I was trying to figure out how to get back in and like write the petition and everything, I'm like, do I know any lawyers? No, I don't. I'm on Twitter like, yo, do I know any lawyers? Like, can y'all help? Do-do-do. And like, people responded to the tweet. One guy had been a huge fan of me in Texas. Wow. Reached out, shout out Dylan Drummond, appreciate you, sir. Reached out like, yo, I've been watching your whole career. I think you're dope, how can I help? Right. Like another guy I met in a clubhouse room was like, how can I help? Like, you know what I mean? But I didn't know any lawyers. So when we go back and we tell kids to do stuff like how, what is that? Like, what are the steps to do it? Like, who do I, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So for me, a lot of it, first and foremost, is just representation. Like, this is how you do it. If I can do it, I promise you can. <laughs> and, then, and then secondly, is like, I want to create this place where now when I go and I need help, I can find somebody that understands. 
Safe spaces for sure. Because, yeah, uh, I mean, that's that's one of those things that's um, just in terms of like the like the mental health and the and, and, and like the law side. But, yeah, asking for help is something that, you know, what happens, what happens in the house. Yes. What happens in our household stays in our household. That's it. I yeah. mean, that you know that that's like that. That's how a lot of us were raised. Some of us were raised wherever you know wherever people might be in their in their life in their place. But then it's like okay, so then I do ask, and then I don't get somebody that looks like me. So how am I? So now I have to. Now I'm sitting in a session, and we're not talking about what what I'm plagued with. This is an education session to where you're asking me certain stuff, and and I went to, I went to grad school for counseling. So I was looking around the room and there was like, in a class of 12, one, mm-hmm. class of tw- class of maybe like 50, there might've been like three of us. And it was just, it was, re- it was real uncomfortable. Yes. It, it was, it was real uncomfortable. And then I'm like, okay, I get y'all understand the book knowledge, but do y'all understand the relatability piece? And that's the part for me, because like I don't think you like yeah you can go through the textbook, but then what happens when somebody has something that's outside of these pages? How are we gonna address that then? And lived experience is crazy. Even just being in my criminal law class, and we're talking about like gang violence specifically, because I grew up in LA, right? Like that's mm-hmm. a huge part of our justice system. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And like one of the girls in the class, because um, it was sentencing law, so we were talking about like gang enhancements. Um, and depending on the law, like if they find out you're in gang, I could add five to 10 years to your sentence of whatever you did, like off the top. Mm. Right. And so one of the girls, like her parents were, um, um, prosecutors. Okay. And she's like, I grew up like watching my mom and do, do, do. And I'm like, yeah, I grew up. These are my folk. Like I ain't affiliated, but like my people are, you feel me? Like yeah. I grew up understanding like the reality of the situation. So I'm like, you're saying all these things, but you don't have experience actually. Because you've never been to this. like, And it's also crazy growing up in L.A. Because people don't cross certain freeways. They can grow up in L.A. their whole life and never been to Compton. Never been to Inglewood. Like, That's amazing. It's crazy. That's am- I mean, I, I can understand why you would, in your mind, you would just say, oh, okay, this is the way we go. Yeah. This is the way we go. We Ain't never, never had a reason way. to get off that freeway. Yeah. Ain't never touched the 105. Like, it's insane to think about it. But these are also the same people that are policing, that Ooh. are that are the teachers, that are, right, that are the lawyers that are prosecuting. These are the same people. And I I think, like, you know, those things are so important because, right, like you're saying, like, I don't have the relatability because I've read about it. I've only seen one side of it. I don't understand, like, the dynamics that play into that. Man. Oh. The world that we're in. Oh, my goodness. Man. And then, the, and then the other part, this is just, this is kind of completely left, but how there are some people who, because like, like you were saying, they don't go to certain places, but there are some people in certain parts of our country to where they may, might have never had a black friend. Bro, ah, and this is why college is so important. Literally, this is what I, this is why I harp about college all the time. Like, I'm not a person that's like, you need an education, you got to go to college, you won't succeed. No, because I don't think we live in a society that is true anymore. I think largely, I think our generation, like half of us, where that was had to be a true thing, Mm -hmm. our parents for sure, there was no reality for it as a black person to get a decent job with no college degree. But I think the younger generation, like they've created this marketplace with social media, with the internet, where you don't need a college degree really, right? So I'm not one of those people that are like, you got to go to college or you want to succeed in life. I don't believe that. However, I do believe that college broadens your horizons and it creates a network that a lot of us don't have. Mm-hmm. Especially mm-hmm. if we come from scenarios where our parents just live regular nine to fives, right? We may not have like entrepreneurial people in our, in our immediate circle or somebody that has done this like trade profession in our immediate circle. So I feel like college at the bare minimum, one, it introduces you to two different people from different places and different walks of life, which for people that come from very like close knit or um, kind of like small town vibes or, you know, like just very much, I hang out with my people and my family and that's it. Mm-hmm. Like it uh, introduces you to that person you've been hearing about. Right. Mm-hmm. And then on the flip side of that, it creates a network because a lot of us could be like, yeah, I really don't want to go to college. I know what I want to do, but I don't know nobody that does that. Yeah. I don't know anybody that can help me with that. And I think that's what college gives you for real. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Then here's another challenge. Oh, I'm just going to throw this out here. But what happens when you go to college 
let's just say, hypothetically, let's just say that you're an athlete at the college, right? <laughs> and then let's just say you're meeting these people, but you're not tapping into these connections Man. while you're on the campus. Uh, what about that? Talk to me about that. Uh, honey. Talk to me about that. Why? Why? I know the why in the short term. And of course, I'm saying this looking back. Yeah, for sure. But it's like, let's just say you were at the University of Texas. Let's just say, you know, you UT alum. I was yeah. UT Tyler. <laughs> hey, you know. But like, you have a network to where you got Matthew McConaughey on campus. Yeah. You know, you got a network to where Kevin Durant is in the network. You got a network to where I can't even imagine how many other, you know, attorneys, lawyers, People who pursued whatever they pursued, what is the biggest, what is the biggest issue that will happen if student athletes don't connect with these people while they have access and while they have their ear on campus? Man, um, that was something I didn't learn to do well either. Networking has, I'm better slightly, like this much, <laughs> um, but it's always been so scary to me. Yeah. Um, and even when I think about it, it's because my entire life someone has introduced me. Mm. I've never walked into a room and someone been like, and I had to be like, hey, I'm so-and-so. Someone has always either known me or introduced me. Mm. Like, that is the benefit of being a star athlete, right? When you walk in a room, everybody knows you. I remember going to my accounting classes and before, after we had a good game, my coach would put the, my teacher would put the, the article. We would start classes being like, you know, Imani had 20 last night. <laughs> like, I swear to God. <laughs> And I used to be so embarrassed. And that's how we would start my accounting class. Wow. During season, every every day, she would be like, hey, hey. You know the women's basketball team? Like, every time. So I've, I never had the experience of having to go in and be like, hey, I'm so-and-so. Nice to meet you. I do X, Y, Z. I never had to do that. Because every time I walked in the room, it was, I knew you. Or, hey, that's she plays for the basketball team. So I think in one regard, athletes don't, it's scary Right. It's scary to walk into new spaces and have to do what everyone else does all the time yeah. <laughs> and say, hi, I'm so and so. Da, 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 da. Um, so we don't learn those skills innately. Mm. Um, and then furthermore, if you're not a star athlete, sometimes it's, it's a little it's a little intimidating to walk in and say, I play for the basketball team. And they're like, mm. <laughs> they're like, mm, I think I know everybody. Like, oh. you're like, no, no, I do. I do. Like, you know what I mean? So I think. Developing those skills when you're in a place to do that. Mm. Um, and then two, I hate the NCAA. This NIL thing did not make me hate them less. Um, I think my biggest argument for the NCAA has always been your cap. The reason you go to college is to build a network and you are handicapping athletes networks. Because mm. when you go to college, if I was just a regular accounting major and I didn't play sports, the reason I got my job would be because I was in accounting one with Billy and Billy's dad now has an accounting firm. He mm. called and made a call for me and when I got to the interview. All I had to do was not be stupid, right? <laughs> yeah, like, I yeah, didn't have yeah, to yeah. impress anybody. I like, went through, went, just went through the process. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's how 80% of America moves, right? They know somebody they met in college, and that person knows somebody, and that is what college is, is building that network. And for athletes, because I'm an athlete, now they can't go out of their way for me. Mm. But if I was a regular student, the same person would have did the same thing, and it wouldn't have been a problem. So that's always been my biggest harp of NCAA is that regardless of the fact that you're robbing these kids, is the fact that you're, you're not setting them up for the next step. Like, and luckily, like, and that's one thing I tell kids now, like, being an athlete is a treasure trove because everyone wants to be an athlete. Yeah. Everybody wanted to be able to do that, and a lot of people weren't able to. So whether you played five minutes or 100, they're just like, oh, you was on the team? Wow, like, tell me about it. Tell me about those things that you learned. And I think we don't understand how to translate that into real life, right? Like, but in reality, right, you were playing a team sport. Even if you're playing a, a, not a team sport, right? You're mm -hmm. doing golf or tennis. Um, you learn how to compete in an environment of pressure. Mm -hmm. You learn how to handle different different um, personalities. You learn how to handle conflict. You learn how to get back up. These are all things that people want in corporate America. But we don't know how to sell those things because we weren't given the tools during that time, which is what everyone else is learning. Mm -hmm. We're learning how to be pro athletes, even though 2% of us are going to be pro athletes. And you're in the 2%, though. I am in the 2%. Yeah, 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 you're in the 2%. But I had a real, I've had a real job, so, huh? Mm. <laughs> oh, man. You st okay, so we went and started talking about sports a little bit. I want to, I just got to talk with you about, because, I mean, since it's, since it's new and since it's recent news, and I've seen your Twitter feed. Uh, I found <laughs> you on Twitter, I know it was on Instagram, but 
What do you, what do you what are what are your thoughts about this Caitlin Clark? Oh, no, don't and, do it to me. No, and, and Ice Cube with, no, the, with the five minute. Like, what are your what are your thoughts? I've been avoiding because I don't. Y'all gonna hate me. I don't want to talk. <laughs> so listen, I think that first and foremost, um, be mad at Cube's PR team because they could have did this way better, right? Mm. Like. I, 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 I think that people are assuming one that Ice Cube knows basketball. I don't I don't give people I don't give people that grace. I don't think that people know basketball. I think mm. people look at stuff and they say, Oh, they scored a lot of points, they're good at basketball. I don't think people actually know the game, right? So one, Ice Cube didn't think about if she would be successful in the big three. Mm. That's not what he's thinking about at all. Mm. He's thinking about the white white America doesn't watch the big three. Mm. Who do, who has white America in Stitches. <laughs> Who has white America clutched right now? Mm. Caitlin Clark. Now, can Caitlin Clark play in a big three? No. No, she cannot. She can't. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. She can't play in a big three. Caitlin Clark is a great basketball player. She's a great prolific scorer. But we just watched West Virginia lock her up. Mm. So you telling me ex NBA player, like, she's not getting a shot off. She's not getting a shot off. Mm. Huh? What are we talking about right now? Like, are you serious right now? Like, are we seriously, are we seriously having this? Like, what are y'all talking about? Like, she's not getting a shot off. Against West Virginia, she, she had a good stat line. But she had six turnovers. It was 8 to 22. Against mm. West Virginia. West Virginia don't have no All-Americans. Mm. They had one little girl that was like, not today. <laughs> and that's what she did all day. <laughs> And a lot of that was her getting bailed out by files. Like, mm. what are we talking about? She can't play in the big three. Now, are there WNBA players that can play in the big three? A couple, right? Arike Gumbawale, Jewel Lloyd, even Natasha Cloud. Natasha Cloud, I don't think she would probably score a lot, but she would, she would be able to fit in, facilitate, get her buckets when she needed to pick her points, mm. right? Reek going to get a buck. Jewel going to get a buck. It don't matter who in front of them, right? But again, the big three ain't even for that. The big three is for retired and overseas play NBA players and overseas male basketball players. Now, I'm not mad at Cube at all. Because that man said, I see, I see. That yeah, man had yeah, a vision, yeah. okay? <laughs> that man had a vision, okay? Yeah, he said, how do sure. I because white America doesn't know nothing about the big three? Big three play in black cities and they have black players. I don't is there a white player in the big three? I don't, exactly. I don't, I don't know if I if I've seen one. But it, it might but be it, one or two. But either way, I'm sure them Google searches started going up after. If, what do you? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. this bad for Clayton Clark because I just I don't feel bad for certain demographics, um, <laughs> and <laughs> I feel this bad for her because a lot of people she's like become such a phenomenon now that people yeah. are using her name for clickbait, right? People are putting putting her name on stuff just so they can get searches and people to pay attention, and that's what happened with this. Cube was like, yo. And now, if I'm Cube, though, if she doesn't make the Olympic team, I'm going to have her at every game and during the Olympic break in July, doing a shootout, doing a meet and greet. Mm. I'm going to do all of that. Show mm. up. I give you, I give you a, a milli. Mm. Come sign some things and do a shootout at halftime. Like, what? I'm for sure having you at all the games. What? I get it. I get it. But to think it was a real offer, to think she can actually compete in that league, to think that Cube had any type of deference to think about women's sports. No, because, no, all the stuff he said after I offered her five million, million was stupid. It was stupid and it was a lie. Shut up. <laughs> now, you should have had a better PR team because they could have crafted a beautiful little statement and you could have, we could have made it cute. Uh -huh. So, again, the villains of the week were Big Three and his... PR team, the or lack thereof. Of the week. That's so hilarious. Or lack thereof. <laughs> okay, so what? So what do you? What do you attribute to? We we'll pivot off Caitlin Clark a little bit, I guess. But what do you? What do you attribute to? Um, to the women's NCAA uh, tournament or, or women's basketball really exploding versus over the past few years? You know, it hasn't been as visible. Even though you know the women been hooping. Women the internet. Been hooping. The internet. Hmm. That's why you're so mad when. Um, Again, they gonna torch me for this. God bless. <laughs> <laughs> I get so mad when Angel and Caitlin are like, "We're building women's basketball." I'm just happy I got to do it, girl. 
the internet. <laughs> oh! uh, like, no, it's just a sign of the times. Mm. Right? Like, Instagram came out my freshman year of college. Mm. And we weren't using it. Nah, you know what I mean? Nah. Like, it wasn't what it was. Twitter was, Twitter was the vibe. And then you got to yeah. think about even, like, even when we go to recruiting high school players, I was a top 10 player in the country. I, did, I had one highlight tape of me and five other people. Remember, you know, we had, we had Hoop Girls, we had ESPN. It was paragraphs about players. Mm-hmm. You used to get to the tournament and be like, oh, that's so-and-so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't yeah, know yeah. what these people look like. You would hear, used to hear Ricky Johnson be like, oh, crazy. That's, I read about you, bro. Like, <laughs> that's what it was. It wasn't, you didn't have videos. We didn't that's have, weird. like, so a lot of this is literally the fact that TikTok exists, Instagram, t- like, we didn't have social media at our disposal the way they do now. Mm-hmm. Even now, you're looking at um, before every W before every NCAA women's game. They say for the fourth year in a row, every NCAA women's game is on an ESPN channel. The fourth year, I've been out of college for almost ten years, mm-hmm. and I played at a, a Power Five school. Yeah. So you're telling me that only when we got to the Elite Eight to the Sweet Sixteen were our games on ESPN channels. So it isn't, and I'm not knocking anything about them that good for them. I love that they become stars. Mm -hmm. I love that for them. But I'm saying like, it isn't that they're that different. Mm. It's that we see them, we can follow them, we can tap in with them. I tell people all the time, we don't buy the what, we buy the who and the why. Mm -hmm. And with women's sports specifically, we never know the who and the why. Like you're not selling women's basketball, bro. Like women's basketball is not that great. Like, no, I don't come to the game because I love watching women's basketball. I come to the game because I know so-and-so. Because Diana Taurasi finna act the fool. She finna score from whatever, right? Like, I come to the game because, I, oh, my God, like, Imani went to Texas. I remember her playing in Texas when I was there. Or, oh, my God, my Morris from Georgia. Like, I'm from Georgia, too. Those are the, you know, like, you buy the stories. Like, for sure. People don't watch 90, it's a 90-something games for the NBA before playoffs, bro. You telling me people like basketball that much that they're watching 90 games, dog? 90? Hell no. That's a lot of games. <laughs> no, they just understand. We, we know the 16 players on the bench favorite color. We know their entire life story. So, yeah, like, I'm watching it because I love Aisha and those babies. So I'm going to go watch Steph play, right? Like, oh, my God, LeBron's from Akron. out. Wow, I remember growing up and watching him play in high school. Like, we know the story, so that's why we tune in, right? Like, that is what it is. It isn't the fact that people love basketball. Like, yeah, they probably have, like, a crazy fan that really just loves basketball that much. But in reality, the NBA has a casual fan. And how do you get casual fans? By telling stories. So that's what's been happening in the in- women's NCAA. We, we've been telling stories. Mm. We watch these kids, and we know where they're from. And, oh, my God, I saw her in high school. And... Oh my, like, that's what it's been. And it's been the fact that we can actually do that now. Like, I've been saying for years, women's basketball fans are, like, the most dedicated people ever because they got to go on a scavenger hunt to follow people. Oh. They got to do the most. You can't escape the NBA. Yeah, that's true. Like, you can't escape those things. That's for sure. And so I, I think that's where we're getting to women's basketball now, where these kids are on shade room. Like, you know, like, they... they all over. Social they media, now become over. like, you know, like a phenomena where we really want to know and watch and play. Like, so that's what it's become. But that's the difference. It's the internet, man. I wish I knew how to use TikTok. You know, on TikTok? I'm old. I have old. When people send me TikTok, I have to watch it online. Mm. Yeah, it's a different, it's just a different world. Like, and like people discount what access does. Like, mm. that's it. It isn't that, like, people been trying to say, oh, my God, no one wants to watch women's basketball. Bro, where do we watch it? <laughs> where do I not, where do I choose not to watch it if I didn't want to? <laughs> like, I choose not to watch it. Like, you ain't flipping the channel and being like, ooh, women's basketball. Nope. It's not on the channel. <laughs> like, now, okay, true. cool. So we've seen the numbers because you let people be able to do it. Mm. Okay. Like, it's not that... They be acting like it's rocket science, man. Come on, bro. Just put it on TV and let somebody make the decision. Okay, okay, okay. I had to, I had to get your input there. I had to get your input. So now we're going we're gonna to take a slight... We're going to take a slight pivot. And uh, I like to... Like, I have, like, a, a rapid-fire segment. Mm-hmm. I like to call it this or that. You know, just, just a little uh, fun game. So, you know, you pick one or the other, right? <laughs> so, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Um, left hook or up and under? 
Black Hook, I'm terrible at counter moves. God bless. <laughs> God bless. <laughs> Would you rather hoop in the States or abroad? Mmm, that's tough. My bank account says abroad, because I'm not that guy. Um, but it's the best league in the world, so the States, for sure. I get you. I get you. Pancakes or waffles? Waffles. Mountains or beaches? <laughs> <Not neither. laughs> I'm an indoor cat, bro. Uh, I'm going to go mountains because I hate sand. Okay, okay. High tops or low tops? When you're hooping, high tops. High tops. tops. I, I'm a big girl. I need to support. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. TikTok. I mean, Twitter or Instagram? Instagram. It used to be Twitter, but Elon ruined everything. I, I don't even get on. I, I went on Twitter the other night just because I know you was on Twitter, but I was like. It's not even the it's same, a lot man. Of bots and it's just it's he ruined it. God bless. Yeah, I don't. I don't but before know that, that pre Elon, Twitter for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I rock with Twitter, especially around like you know sporting events and yeah, stuff like you, that. And BT BT Wars. It be so fast, man. You gonna get I'm the, like, the jokes gonna come so, so fast, quick. man. I'm like y'all are so quick. How do y'all come up with this stuff? Yes. I don't. I don't understand it. But uh, okay. So then there's. I got two. These two last questions. So then uh, I, I always like to ask, um, who is uh, who is the next guest that you think I should interview on Beyond the Ball? Hmm. I want one of the NIL kids. Yeah. I don't know the kids. <laughs> I don't be paying attention now. But I would want to see I want to see an NIO kid cuz I think they just have a different Okay. Think of a different perspective about everything like like their entire experience is just so much so vastly different than ours, you know? For sure. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay, well, okay. Now now it's two more questions. Then, <laughs> then we're done. Then we're done. I always like to do a. Uh, I always like to do a winter circle of the week. So this is somebody you want to highlight. You think they haven't been getting their just due, but they've been grinding. They've been putting in work, wherever it might be, athlete, non-athlete, whatever. But who is who is the person for you? You're like these flowers are for you. Hmm. You're asking me to care about someone other than myself. That's hard. Man, that's tough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. With a uh, gardener from Oregon State, um, they just played and she killed. She was killing. She was killing. Um, they played today, actually. I think I'm pretty sure they played today. Okay. But yeah, nah, she just put a team on her back for real. Cause Oregon State was not supposed to get to the lead eight at all, and she showed up, showed out from every position too. She's like a three four. Oh okay. So she was shooting the three, getting the paint. Banging, had a defense on her back too. It was nice. That sounds like a little bit of your game. Um, I appreciate you thinking that of me. <laughs> I'm just, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing because I mean, I know you'll step out and shoot, and I've seen, you know, I've seen you get busy in the post. So yeah, you know, tell tell Jim that, you know, tell your favorite Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, I got you. And then uh, th this is the uh, this is the dear student athlete segment where we round it out with a bow. But what is one tip that you want to leave for a student athlete? And one resource you want to recommend for a student athlete. And look into your camera so they okay. can just hear from you. Um, I got to look up the resource, but I follow them. So I got to look them up. But tip, um, you will always be bigger than your sport. It does not matter how big the sport becomes. It doesn't matter how good you are. You will always be bigger than your sport. So remember that. Um, it is important to separate who you are from what you do. Your sport is what you do. Who you are is so much bigger than that and so much more important. My resource for student athletes would be Athletes Org. It is um, athletes.org. It's ran by Brandon Copeland, who is a retired NFL player. And it's about helping you manage this new landscape that you are competing in as a student athlete, be it money management with NIL deals, um, perfecting your brand, becoming more than an athlete, and understanding the difference between your identity and your profession and your sport. So yeah, athletes.org, Brandon Copeland, tap in. There it is, there it is. Imani, where can people find you, follow you, stay connected with you on your journey? Um, Instagram, at Imani Trishan, I-M-A-N-I-T-R-I-S-H-A-W-N, at Imani Trishan, 
on Twitter at Imani Shashan with the underscore at the end. Um, but you have better look on Instagram. Gotcha. There it is. Thank you for you know coming through, gracing the uh, the Speaker Success Media Studios. No, this is great. I had a great time. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I think thank you. Definitely added a lot of value, and it's cool just to hear a little bit more of your story, and you know, just un- unpack your life a little bit to you know, be a role model. A role in whatever model. Whatever that means for you know, in whatever way that means for you. Hey, in whatever way that means for you. And everybody out there who's watching, who's following, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button. If you're listening then be sure to hit the follow. But this is Beyond the Ball with Jonathan Jones, where we help student-athletes succeed beyond their degree.